Is that the right one? Awesome. So uh, we kind of already did the intros. Uh, I'm John Henry or JH. Uh, and then we have Bob here as well. I think he's knitting uh, as usual in meetings. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> we uh, we both work at user interviews. Bob's one of the co-founders. Uh, I've been with the team for a little over three years as a head of product and design. Um, and we'll just tell you a little bit about uh, how we landed on Shape Up and what we were doing before. So um, there we go. Uh, before Shape Up. Um, so when I came on, um, obviously Bob had been there from the start as a co-founder. Uh, the team was very small. And so it was really just Bob, one other developer, and myself. Um, and at that stage, it was just really easy to coordinate everything because it was such a small group. And we were all so in sync with what was a priority in the business and what we were working on. So we were really just kind of in a rolling Kanban type of approach. Um, did this for about a year. Uh, team grew a little bit. I think we added a third or fourth developer in that uh, period. Uh, I don't have the exact details. And, you know, it was pretty standard. We would uh, have a weekly meeting to kind of groom issues and, and pull stuff up to the top. Uh, as things got completed, we'd pull in new tasks. Um, what we did do that was kind of unique and maybe a little bit of a precursor to some of the shape up stuff was, uh, you can kind of see a picture of it below. We would try to allocate like what were big efforts or important projects um, that we needed to do just as a frame or overlay on top of the Kanban uh, day to day. And so, you know, a couple examples here from back in the day of trying to get social media verification set up for, for some of our users, uh, some targeting work, uh, you know, feedback system, stuff like this. And so uh, we use that really as just like a high level guide so that when we were deciding how to prioritize or what to put where, we had some thing to kind of balance it off. Um, and yeah, that was really it. Um, Bob, I don't know if there's anything you would highlight from, from these early days um, when we were kind of doing this rolling Kanban approach. No, I think yeah, the only other point I make is just that this is before we were fully remote. So again, we also had like that benefit of just like all of us sitting in the same room all the time. Um, you know, again, we, so it's like, yeah, it was very, very, very fluid process. Yeah, I guess uh, to, to give me to give a little bit more color on that. Um, at the time on the product side, it was really three of us. We all happened to be in Boston. So we would meet up in an office space. Um, and then pretty quickly after that, we all transitioned to being fully remote as people moved or the team grew. Um, and so now we are about 36 people as a full company, uh, fully remote, 10 engineers, a couple of people on the product side. So uh, it's gotten a lot bigger and more complex uh, in, in that three year span. Um, cool. And so from there, uh, as the team did grow, we moved to a more uh, traditional kind of like scrum approach, um, embracing sprints. And so we've scaled up to about six developers throughout this period. Um, we kind of experimented a little bit with one week sprints and two week sprints. We, we settled on two week sprints pretty quickly. So that was what we did the majority of this time. Um, and it was, you know, your standard kind of scrum practices. I'd, I'd worked that way in past roles. Um, so we had a planning meeting where we would be pointing tickets and figuring out what the commit was, you know, keeping track of our velocity. Um, and that was nice because as we were growing the team, it was familiar to people coming in. A lot, you know, most people had worked that way before or something close to it. Um, and we did find that um, a thing we started to have an issue with with Kanban was that we had a few uh, projects that kind of just rolled on forever and never felt like we got to an endpoint. And so the structure of the sprints and uh, the kind of forcing mechanism to, to get work done uh, within that was, uh, was pretty helpful for us. So it did help us improve delivery. Um, I guess full disclosure, I've never been a huge Scrum fan. So this was not like my favorite phase. I know it works um, and has good merits, but it's just never been my favorite approach to product development. And so it did start to feel like at the end of it, that the end of every sprint, the last day or two would always can be a grind and people would be working really hard to hit the commit and wrap everything up, uh, which is a nice forcing function, but you know, some concerns about sustainability uh, long-term there. Um, and then we were fully remote at this time and trying to do the planning and <laughs> planning meetings remote when you're asking people to point the complexity of stuff uh, just is very dry. It was hard to get engagement. You just got like a lot of, you know, people turning their cameras off or, <laughs> faces that didn't look like they were fully engaged. And so I think also just being in a remote team, those meetings were, uh, were a challenge. Um, Bob, anything to add on uh, our Scrum phase? Not really. I think the only other thing to add is that we were really, really good at making sure that our sprint was already half full by the time we were done because we never finished sprints. We always just had whatever carryover we had. So we were really bad at yeah, this was, um, I don't think Bob and I would be like the poster <laughs> children for uh, how to do Scrum well. So. Uh, we had a lot of carryover, um, you know, from our commits. We weren't probably the most disciplined on it. So I think uh, it probably could have worked better for us if we were, you know, stricter adherence to, um, you know, the best practices there. But I think just for the two of us, it's never like totally fit our style. And so, um, you know, that's uh, that's a quick backstory. So, you know, that's a good chunk of the time uh, as we grew the team. And then 
you know, about about a year ago, um, a little after Shape Up kind of became well known, um, we started transitioning to it. Uh, I kind of had always followed the Basecamp guys to some degree and, and read some of their books and stuff. Just think they're interesting in the way they do things and, um, you know, don't agree with all of it, but it's cool to hear people who have original thoughts on product development and different ways of doing things versus just kind of like, you know, another medium article that is just regurgitating the standard stuff that everybody writes about. So I uh, appreciate kind of their unique lens they put on things. And so when I saw Shape Up came out, uh, a lot of it resonated with me. And so I started kicking around with Bob and, and some of the other uh, co-founders is, you know, is this something that we want to consider, um, you know, not having loved Scrum and, and starting to feel like some of the, the pain points within it. Um, and so just to call it out, like what appealed to us at a high level um, in terms of like, or wait, should we, do you want to pause in that transition or just keep rolling and we'll do questions later? Or... So final question. So I'd say yeah. keep rolling. Um, okay, yeah. Cool. I'm happy to do questions whenever. So just <laughs> chime in if you have one. Um, so uh, there are three things that really jumped out to us. I think the biggest one, and, and we'll probably spend the most time here throughout the talk, is just this notion of fixed time variable scope. Uh, I think for Bob and I and, and one of the co-founder, one of the other co-founders, Basil, um, this just really stood out because I think the challenge of prioritization without fixed time variable scope is um, it's like it's hard to know the it's hard to know what order you want to do things in if you don't know the cost of those things. And so this thing might seem really exciting if it's going to take us two weeks and it's not exciting at all if it's going to take us 12 weeks um, in terms of like the impact on the business or the impact of users. And so what's nice about the fixed time variable scope mentality that comes in shape up is if all the efforts we're doing are the same size, now you're just looking at what's most impactful to the business. Um, and it's a little bit simpler. It's like once you have one stake in the ground, there's something else to kind of focus and anchor off. Um, and so that part uh, appealed to us and, and we like that as, a, as an approach. Um, and just generally, we like the idea of like, time boxing efforts um, with a meaningful amount of time. So you, could, so you could tackle interesting projects or deliver meaningful solutions to users, um, but not have them just drag indefinitely. Um, we also like the idea of really rallying around specific efforts. So I think part of the you know, annoyance we had with uh, sprints was that like they would start to be a little jumbled, like maybe two thirds of the sprint would be around whatever was the priority at the moment. And then we'd start filling up the rest of the uh, desired velocity or expected commit which is like odds and ends that were the right point values to kind of get to the right total. Um, and so you kind of had this like split focus and some context switching. And so we like the idea of, hey, you know, like the scheduling effort is really important and let's, let's just have a squad like single focus on that for this duration of time and, until we get to um, something that, you know, is out in the wild. And then um, similarly, like not being the most hardcore about like scrum processes and stuff. We liked the idea that a big part of shape up was that after the, the, it's shaped and you hand it off to the implementation, implementation team, they own a lot of the day-to-day -day decision making and how they work and how they collaborate and what part they integrate first. And there's just some autonomy within the people that are, you know, in the weeds doing the work and like encountering hiccups or forks in the road or whatever, and um, giving them the flexibility to figure out how to navigate through those as a, as a collective unit was something that was appealing to us because we didn't want to have to micromanage, you know, all of those implementation decisions. Um, as long as the high level parameters were, were being stayed within. So um, those are the three things. Bob, any uh, thing you'd highlight here or, or speak to? I don't know if you can see me, but now I'm good. Cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was just one of those things. I think like the simplest way to say it is like we read through it when it came out, there was a lot in there that clicked with us. Um, and so we started thinking about, you know, how we could adopt it or what that might look like in our organization. So um, I'd imagine people have had similar experiences um, as they encountered it. And, if you showed up here, I'd imagine something about it resonated with you. So um, that was what resonated with us. Um, I guess the thing we should flag, though, is just even from the start, uh, it never was done exactly by the book in our organization. Um, and the biggest reason for that and the biggest divergence we had right off the bat was the length of the cycles. So, you know, um, we're we were still a pretty small early stage startup at, at that time in the sense of, um, you know, we didn't have the largest team. Uh, we had, you know, good monthly revenue and, and we're continuing to see it grow, but, you know, we do have fundraising objectives and we want to be nimble and respond to change or inputs as we can. And so the idea that every effort we bite off is going to be basically eight weeks packaged because you have six weeks of build and two weeks of cool down um, felt, uh, just felt long to everybody. Like when we would talk to people about it, they'd agree with a lot of the principles or find the book really interesting, but there'd just be this like nagging hesitation of like, I don't know if everything we do at this stage of our business, we can commit to spending eight weeks on it. That feels like a, kind of just like a big chunk of time. Like we would kind of like say, like maybe we had two squads at that time. 
we would like, you know, forecast out the year. And it's like, we only get this many at bats in a year. It's not, it's not a lot of chances. And so if we're wrong on some of these, um, we can't iterate as quickly as we want. And so through some discussion, um, and there's, there was a meaningful amount of back and forth on this. I think we were kind of split initially. Some people, some of us were kind of more in the camp of like, this is how they say to do it. <laughs> they've thought about this a lot and they've done it a lot and they landed here. Maybe we should just do it that way. And then others were like, well, maybe we can take the principles, but do it our own way. And, you know, and that side ended up winning out. And so what we did was we landed on four week cycles. Um, and the reason for that really was just, um, you know, it says it here, but like that four weeks felt long enough to tackle meaningful problems and do meaningful work. It didn't feel like it was gonna be rushed and everything was gonna be super small. Um, but it is, you know, 50% shorter than uh, six weeks. So, um, or did I do that math right? I might have messed up the math. It's, it's shorter. Um, and then uh, we landed on uh, one week cool down periods. And so, uh, again, not a lot of science here. It was basically just like, that seemed like the bare minimum. Uh, it seemed like going shorter than a week wasn't going to be enough. Um, and then more than a week, the ratio is kind of weird because if you're doing four weeks build, two weeks cool down, a lot of cool down relative to build uh, compared to six two. And so, uh, we landed on this four one cycle. Um, uh, happy to again if any questions on here, but uh, Bob, do you remember anything about like this initial like kind of rollout or debate and in, in the four one stuff that you had? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the, uh, I think a couple of the variables that I can talk to is um, one, I think in general, like as throughout the history of the company, we've been pretty big on like we build it, um, uh, like we build something and then see if it gets traction, and then we continue building it if it's getting traction, um, and we've really like tried to buy into that. So again. The idea of like six weeks just felt like, you know, most of the builds before that we didn't need six weeks because like if we're spending six weeks on it, like that's like a huge feature. To, that was like a huge feature to us, sort of a huge change to us. Um, so I think that might be a little bit unique in how kind of we attack things that it was always like, like we just throw minimum viable solutions on there. And then um, obviously we have a great support team um, that does a lot of, you know, the handholding and, and, and kind of, you know, the, the mechanical Turk, if you will, um, in the back end to, to make things kind of work. Um, and that's just been kind of like, part of our DNA since the beginning. Um, and so I think that's where like, you know, making it shorter was was probably more meaningful to us just because we do generally think in such small increments um, and trying to just get things out. And like, there's so many things we've just not followed up on because no one used it or, um, you know, obviously continued. And then I think the other thing here is, is that um, we do definitely have micromanaging uh, co-founders, uh, myself included. And so therefore uh, the idea of, of letting us run around for eight weeks was I think a little bit out of their comfort zone for probably incorrectly, but uh, definitely something to be noticed here. Yeah, and I think uh, it's just an interesting maybe observation is people are at different stages in adopting this. Like even now, like, you know, a year later as we've gotten bigger and there's a little bit more autonomy and separation between like, you know, the other two co-founders, myself, like uh, this is a little easier as we've kind of grown into it. But I think just like when you're adopting it is, uh, is pretty impactful in terms of like how you might want to adopt it is at least been our experience. Um, cool. And There's a couple of questions rolling, yeah. so maybe let's, yeah. Let's, uh, the first one I'm seeing is, how do you handle shaping the pitch from an engineering standpoint? Are you doing technical spikes before the pitch kicks off with the team? Yeah, yeah so this is one, um, a lot of the times I will, like, again, this may be unique to us, so I don't know how this would but like, I know the code base really, really well since I wrote most of it. Um, so it's generally the way that we do it is that we will, um, like, I'll just kind of, think through solutions and kind of, I'll, I'll be doing some investigation into it to see like what I think the minimum viable solution is. Um, and then within that, um, usually be able to get like a decent feel of it. Um, one thing that we have been prioritizing recently, especially as I've become less hands-on with the day-to-day -day, is making sure that um, the engineers do get to at least like buy in and, and understand kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I think the biggest thing there has really been making sure that in our shape up document and in our shaping document, that were relatively clear or that were like really clear about what my expected, what I was thinking of when I said that I thought that, that something meaningful could be done in this much time. Um, because I think that a lot of time, like, I think we've had bad experiences where it's, we've been like, Hey, like this is the thing you're going to work on. And then the engineers go off and, and, you know, don't necessarily go down the paths that I go down because they don't know the code base like I do. And so um, I think there's definitely been a disconnect there that needs to be get fixed. Um, but that's been our general process is, is, is mostly just, um, you know, using my knowledge of the code base and the parts that we're going to change to ensure that we actually have something meaningful um, and then try to get a little bit of buy-in from the engineers as we kind of develop our process. I think there's a good question that connects to this. And by the way, when I'm reading these out and you uh, submitted them, feel free to follow up if you feel like you want to, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so the question is, what is the squad doing in cooldown? Do they uh, polish on the pitch work that didn't get done or things completely outside of the pitches? Um, yeah, so uh, that's a good question. I guess uh, one thing we should probably just kind of state from uh, just like how we did it initially was that um, really uh, Bob and I were doing all of the like shaping and pitch work um, and the squads would be doing all of the implementation and build work. And so in the initial days, um, that was kind of the separation. And so there'd be the handoff of like, hey, here's the thing we selected and, and here's the shaping doc behind it uh, for you to pick up and run with. Um, so we were kind of always doing that piece of it, uh, at least early on. And there was, we tried some different things in the middle, which I'll get to later. Um, and so um, in the cool down week, um, again, we'll get to this in a little bit, but uh, I think we've had different phases. One is um, in the very, very initial adoption, I think we saw people really struggle with the fixed time variable scope kind of mentality. And so uh, for better or worse, despite our best efforts to stop people from doing this, uh, they would get something shipped, you know, by the end of the cycle and then just spend the cooldown week doing more stuff related to the cycle that they wanted to finish, but, but couldn't, um, which wasn't the worst thing, but it didn't really feel like the spirit of like, you know, undirected cooldown time to maybe work on, you know, some code based style, uh, like patterns that you want to improve or a bug that has been kicking around or like, you know, whatever else might be a pet project for somebody. Um, and then we have evolved into, uh, you know, we'll get to this later, but like actually doing two week cooldowns. Um, and they're, you know, they're not quite undirected. Uh, we've been using them a little bit more for like tech debt and like, I guess we would kind of generally call it like product quality of life um, thing. So doing some stuff to our design system, doing stuff to the code base, um, stuff like that, that just makes it more pleasant to work in for everyone, whether that be design, dev, and others. So um, they're usually kind of like mini little efforts in that regard, but they're things that people tend to be pretty excited about because, you know, we're going to get some of our linting issues corrected or we're, you know, like things like that. So um, uh, we speak to some of that in the future stuff, but uh, uh, I think the initial thing to note and probably something that to watch if you're adopting for this for the first time is it's really hard to not get the teams to just use the cooldown for extra stuff that they wanted to do in the cycle. That was at least our experience. And that's somewhat counterintuitive, I think, because you're thinking like you get this time for cooldown and then you don't use it. Yeah, I know um, like in the in the shape of book, I know they speak to this a little bit. I forget exactly how they frame it, but like, you know, this notion that cutting scope is not cutting quality is I think a hard thing for people to accept or, or to, to rationalize. And so I think the reason that we saw people doing it is that they care a lot about the product and they care a lot about our users. Um, and the idea that like we wanted to do this thing, but we didn't do it in the end is is a uh, is tough to to stomach. And so the idea of just like, well, I'll just get it done now is um you know uh, I think a shortcut that um, a lot of people landed on. Cool. Yeah, and I also think to kind of go to that and, and to speak to like what the engineers were doing specifically, like I think in that period um, we would regularly uh, when we would make trade offs, it would more just be like for like engineering health of like like code like uh, climate stuff um, that would get cut rather than and like keeping a lot of like the product requirements. And so therefore, a lot of the engineers were kind of just self directed, like, hey, I just added a bunch of tech debt, and I know that if I saw this and get blame, I would be very furious at me. So I'm going to go clean that up to make sure that it is actually structured properly. So I think there was like a little bit of that where, again, to JJ's point, like it was really really hard for people to want to cut the product quality out, um, and so therefore they would just you know make cut corners in a tech place. Um, and so therefore it was very, very much up to them. Uh, you know, it was very much in their interest to clean up after themselves so that they wouldn't, you know, get yelled at in the future uh, by someone being like, why would you ever do this? So just like a little color on that as well. That makes sense. Uh, there's two more questions uh, that are somewhat related. So I'll just throw them at you and then you tell me if that, you know, comes later. One question, I, uh, one question I don't know if I quite get it. It says, how do the squads manage implementations in addition to cycle work. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to clarify that, but uh, like to us, we kind of use them synonymously. Like this team is working on, is implementing this cycle right now. And uh, in terms of like specifics, you know, they manage that stuff in, uh, in GitHub issues. Um, it's where they track work um, and, you know, and then they're collaborating over Slack and Zoom primarily. Um, and obviously like Figma and other tools, but um, we, we, yeah, we view implementation and cycle work be, to be to be very similar for the squads, um, if that helps clarify anything. or yeah. All right, and how often uh, does a feature take more than four weeks to do? And if that happens, do you commit more than one cycle to a feature? I think that's a really good question. Um, if we can, I'm actually gonna table answering that one because yeah. uh, 
we've we've changed how we've done shape up a few times and some of the evolutions actually uh speak to that a little bit and so i think um as we get to like two or three slides ahead um i can come back to that and i think uh we can answer it uh with a little bit more context at that point that, that sounds good all right cool to, to, give, to give a clarity on this this one like when we were in this cycle we did, there were times where we would basically say like sure we're saying that this is the effort and we would chunk it into a four-week effort but we were like but like, hey guys, just so you know, like we're gonna do this next cycle too. So like leave some on the table, um, you know? So uh, that definitely did happen. Um, by the way, there are a couple of channel uh, questions coming in through the Zoom Slack, uh, the Zoom chat as well for whatever that's worth. Oh, cool. Yeah, we can grab this. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a good point to, to, to acknowledge is that we did have one or two where we did that, where we did like back-to-back -back cycles because we knew it was a large effort. Uh, we did our best in that world though still to like come up with a clean demarcation so that like this, the first cycle was still like delivering something that was like useful or like had a pin in it to some degree. Um, and then the second cycle was adding onto it. We tried not to just make it like, you know, it's an eight week cycle and you don't get any value until the end of the eight weeks. And so we, we did our best to, in the shaping process, find some way to cleave it in half so that, you know, if we decided not to do that second cycle, there was the first cycle still produced something that was like in a decent state, if that makes sense. Um, cool. All yeah. right. So let me um, just let me just hit this real quick, because uh, I think it sets up some of the future um, kind of evolutions we made. Um, so I think some of the initial wins and initial struggles we had after like, you know, doing a few cycles, basically, was um, I do think our product planning and like prioritization um, got a lot better at like the C-speed level and itself. Um, and I think mainly that like just by having the fixed time and having like some rough shape of what might, might deliver with each it became easier to like reason and argue over like which one we should do first. Um, whereas I think we had a bad habit before this of kind of talking ourselves into like how we could Tetris, like the three things we wanted to do into this, into this quarter and get all three done. And then in reality, we really couldn't. Um, There's something about this that because the time was fixed, you prevent yourself from doing that. And so we actually forced ourselves to say like, this is first, this is second, this is third and not trying to, and you know, obviously revisiting second and third on the next, betting table thing but um it, it kind of helped us like not lie to ourselves and say we could like you know sh shim all these things into the quarter somehow uh, it was like a nice forcing function in that regard um we did see the squads um you know embrace the kind of notion of like integrating a first piece early in the cycle to get like some value and some working thing um that they that they kind of stress in uh, in part of the book uh that was something that we saw the like just from a squad mentality and approach standpoint uh take hold pretty early on which was cool because then just, you know, we'd be a week in and we'd already have some like meaningful progress and like some little tangible piece of the solution that you could see coming. That was just, I think good for like morale, like good to, it's, I think it's a very pragmatic way to step into an effort and, and find out unknowns or edge cases. And so uh, that part was a really nice uh, aspect of it. Um, and then I do think like rallying around specific efforts kind of mentality, one of the things we liked about it, like worked for us, like in those first couple cycles, like maybe we had a little hangover into the cool down week or some other stuff like that, that we had to iron out, but like we were delivering good solutions in those cycles and the team seemed kind of motivated about tackling a specific problem and, and getting some ownership over how they like actually run their work day to day instead of having to like point everything and, and sitting in these planning meetings and stuff up. People seemed refreshed by that. Um, and then as we mentioned before, so I won't hit it too much, uh, it was hard to get uh, squads to embrace variable scope, whether it was the user facing features or tech debt or whatever, um, people tried to get it all done. Um, and that led to cool down weeks, not really being cool down and just kind of going effort to effort to some degree. Um, and then we basically at this time, uh, we're in a world where we had three small squads um, running on cycles. And since all of the shaping and like pitching and stuff is going through Bob and I, all of the squads being on the exact same cadence in terms of like having cool down at the same time, having kickoff at the same time, having like wrap up at the same time, created uh, some stressful points where, you know, in some cases we have like six to nine pitches ready for an upcoming cycle because we had two or three for each squad to consider, which was like a lot to juggle. Um, at the end, as much as we try to integrate and ship within the cycle, uh, as much as possible, I guess we haven't spoke to that, but like, we definitely have not, we've tried to decouple the idea of when you ship stuff to production does not have to equal the cycle. So like if in week two of the cycle, you have something that's ready to go, like you can push it and it's gone. Um, but that said, a lot of the final PRs and a lot of the big pushes tended to come at the end of the cycles is when you have three squads kind of all hitting their big like pushes simultaneously. It's a lot of code review. It's a lot of merging. It's a lot of release it. So like those were kind of stressful points for us um, from there. Um, uh, we good on questions? Should I keep going or? I think you can keep going for a little bit. All right, cool. Uh, yeah. 
So as I mentioned, we, we've we've done a few different things here, and maybe this will set us up for, for a lot of questions from uh, from here forward. Is um we try to do different things, and so uh, with kind of that like stressful uh, us handling all the shaping responsibility, uh, we had a quarter where we gave each squad a very specific outcome that this was their focus. So like a, you know a metric and a very narrow part of the product experience, um, and basically said like it's up you know it's up for you to figure out what to pitch and and shape, um, and then we'll you know we'll approve it, Bob and I. Um, and then that will be what you work on next. Um, maybe not surprisingly to people who've read the book and, <laughs> and understand why they say some, some of the things they say in the book, uh, this didn't go super well uh, because it's hard to own shaping and implementation simultaneously. I think they're very clear in how they outline it that you want that to be two different groups of people because it's a lot of work. And if you're doing it simultaneously, you're kind of shortchanging both. Um, and then similarly, uh, because it's a lot of work, they would often maybe only have like one pitch or thing shaped ready to go going into cycle. And if we didn't agree with it being impactful to the outcome that they were focused on, we'd be kind of left in like no man's land because we didn't have something shaped that we could move forward instead because we kind of only had one of them. So um, uh, we were excited about this just in terms of like, hey, like, you know, this is the metric that you're optimizing. This is the user outcome you're focused on. It's very clear. Um, here's some things. It just, it just, we just didn't have the resources for it. And it was asking too much of this, the squads to shape and implement simultaneously. So, um, you know, uh, I think we did okay this quarter. Like we actually got some meaningful stuff done. Um, it just kind of, I think, left everyone pretty worn out. Like it was not um, probably our highest morale quarter that we've ever had kind of across the, the whole team. Um, anything uh, that you remember from this from this phase, Bob, that's worth calling out? No, I think, yeah, I think that this was an interesting one. This idea was very interesting because we have just like a lot of people who have a lot of like, uh, maybe this has been cleared from um, other parts, but like we have a lot of people who are very product minded and very like very much have like a, a view of the future. Um, and so I think this was like an interesting one because it made it so that everybody got that option to be at that table, but then it made the table a little bit big. So to Jay's point, like when there were disagreements, it was kind of not great. Uh, and it just led to like some real, real slowdowns. Um, yeah, so we did this for about a quarter basically. So it was only a couple cycles. Um, and then we, uh, we kind of shifted. Um, and then the biggest change we made that we've actually maintained that we've been really happy with is uh, we've allowed cycles to be different lengths. And so um, it's like, it gets to be a little bit of a difficult one to explain verbally, but like it still is fixed time. Uh, it just is, we fix a different amount of time depending on what the effort is. And so um, we've decided that it's between two to six weeks. And so we've had now some that span that whole spectrum. We've had a, you know, some two week ones that were successful. We've had some six week ones that worked well for larger things as well. Um, just for like example, uh, a six week one we did recently was around um, like some permission and like role infrastructure uh, so that we could have different users who are able to do different things within the app, uh, which is really like foundational to a lot of upcoming work. So we were happy to allocate six weeks to, to get that right. And then on the two week side, um, we have an experience where you can move things around and we just, you know, we uh, cleaned up how that worked and, and brought in drag and drop just to make it a little bit easier. And so that was one where it was a pretty uh, tightly and narrow focused um, shaping effort and, and we were able to get that done in two weeks. So just a couple examples kind of on the ends of the spectrum. Um, and where we landed now actually is we kind of like got rid of the betting table essentially. And so uh, I think what we started to feel was uh, Basil and Dennis or other two co-founders, the CEO and COO um, would give us a focus for the quarter. And then we'd go into these betting meetings and have the different ideas that we thought were important, Bob and I. Um, and then they would get to pick the, the thing that we worked on and it kind of just felt like we had no discretion in the process. Like they were picking the focus and they're picking the individual efforts. Um, and we had a little bit more context in terms of the day-to-day -day and what, what needed addressing, whether it be from a code health perspective or user feedback perspective. And, um, and honestly, I don't know that they always had the time to like understand the shaping docs in full capacity because there was a lot of them. And so what we landed on was basically uh, we get focuses kind of for each squad for the quarter. That's usually like an outcome, could be feature specific, but it's usually kind of metric driven. Um, and then Bob and I now just have the discretion to decide what's going to get selected and shape it. And then we hand it off to the squads. So that kind of streamlined it a little bit for us. Um, there's still a lot of bait in that. Like Bob and I spend a lot of time together uh, telling each other that one another's ideas are bad and, and figuring out which one to do. Um, so it's, I don't think we've removed like the spirit of the betting table. It just is done now in a small group between the two of us. Um, as most of the cycles can range in length. Um, we do set the cycle during shaping. So when it's given to the squad, there's no ambiguity. It's like, hey, you're spending three weeks on this and here's what you're expected to, to output. Um, and because the, uh, because now the cycles are, uh, you know, different durations, um, instead of doing a, a cool down period after every single one, 
which doesn't really make sense if you just did a two week one to, to allocate a whole week of cool down after a small effort. Um, and we have seen success around longer cool downs. I mentioned that earlier, we like the two week period because it lets us uh, get into some more like interesting tech debt or like just generally, you know, general improvements to the code base or to, to how we manage things um, that uh, we just, we use it kind of at our discretion and each squad gets one cool, uh, cool down period that's two weeks per quarter. And essentially what this lets us do is because all the squads are now working on cycles that are different lengths and we can insert a two week cool down as needed across the squads. Um, we avoid the problem of all squads kicking off on the same day, all squads concluding on the same day. We're able to kind of have it be a little bit more fluid and a little bit more rolling and be like, okay, squad one's wrapping up next week. We have that shaping stuff good to go. Okay, squad two is wrapping up two weeks later. Do we have that stuff? And so it's a little bit more fluid. Um, I think at some point as we as we grow and we get more squads, we'll, we'll hit another breaking point here. But in the interim, it's allowed us to continue to own shaping in a way that's manageable and allow the squads uh, to own implementation, which is you know, some of the original things that we really liked about moving to this process. Um, Bob, any, uh, any stuff to hit here? No, I think the other thing I'd point out is like that this, I think one of the biggest impetuses for this is that we do think on quarters a lot. And like it's to Jay, which Jay, like uh, as Jay pointed earlier, um, you know, we have the meetings with like the, with our product leadership um, pretty much every quarter. And so therefore, um, you know, this allows us to kind of stack things in quarters a little bit better. Um, and and uh, the other thing I'll point out is that like the, just knowing that cooldowns are kind of just on tap, um, you know, a lot of the times it is after, you know, well, it's sometimes it's based on when jh and i need a breather and you know we're like uh you know we're a little bit behind but also we've found great success in having it just you know as a cool down and be like hey this squad has been really at it for a bit and like they need some time away to do something else um and so that that's i know we have one uh squad in cool down right now and, and it just seems like like they really needed it it was like a great place to be able to insert it so um and we have another squad that i don't think we'll need a cool down this uh, quarter because like the work they're doing is like relatively self-directed as a task. So um, yeah, I think that, that dynamicness is, is really nice to just like have that for a variety of reasons. Cool. Um, awesome. So there's a bunch of questions rolling in. Yeah, that's good. Um, cool. All right. So the uh, first one is in writing shapes, how have you structured the amount of detail you provide specifically balancing enough shape and autonomy space for innovation? Yeah, um, I mean, this is one we've definitely messed up in both directions at some point or another. Like we've given, we've handed stuff off with way too little shape and uh, and left a lot of leg work for the squads. And then we definitely handed stuff off that was way overshaped. Um, and the squad felt frustrated that they didn't have much, you know, direction to, to weigh in on the solution. And so uh, I do think it's something that you, you learn by doing a little bit. And I think it's a little dependent on the people you have on your team and like the type of work or gaps that they're comfortable filling in. And so I think uh, for us, we just had to learn that a little bit of, okay, this is too much, like this is, you know, th this is too many open questions for the squad to tackle and this is too directed. And, and given the personalities we have and, and what people like to work on and, and where we have different problem solvers, like that's something that we've started to figure out. And so um, I don't know if I have the best solution or the best answer on how to land in the right spot other than some of the stuff they outline in the book of you know keeping a high level with, with the fat market sketches and sketches and stuff like that but um bob i think you might actually have better thoughts on this one um yeah i think i think my main thing here is i, I don't know that i'd say that, that that we found or that i think that there is a sweet spot in like what fidelity you want something to be right like if it's a two-week cycle and it's something that we really know what we want and we can just give that to a squad and they can just run with it like i don't think that that's wrong and i don't think that a six-week effort that you know we want to let them have that that fluidity and that that openness um, i think the biggest metric for me has been and, and jj and i've really been keying in on this recently is making sure that you don't just base your appetite and the time that you're giving people based on just like the engineering focus that they need but also making sure that like if you're going to have a lot of open questions you need to give your product people enough time to answer those like if you're going to have a lot of screens you need to give design a lot of time and just making sure that you're understanding i think because we were like our product team started with just an engineer and then we added some product but we've really been engineering focused we always think about the engineering time to build it to, and, and um just so making sure that whatever fidelity you do that you're making sure to allot the amount of time that you need for that squad to finish up that work and answer all the open questions you have and to go down all the rabbit holes that you weren't able to go down or you didn't think were important to go. So I think for us, it's usually the longer the cycle, the lower fidelity, the, the, the shorter the cycle, the higher the fidelity, just because the idea is, is it's, it's, it's less again about just like, this is the fidelity I always give it to you at and, and more just 
if I have open questions, I need to give you time and I need to give you appetite to answer those questions. Um, and so, and then obviously you still have the guideline of appetite to say like, like answer the questions, but like only accept answers that you think that you can get done, um, you know, within the appetite after those, those uh, uh, questions have been answered. So um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know that I'd say that there's a specific fidelity that I target for, but definitely like, you know, every open question we leave them, I'm always like, okay, but this is gonna take them time to answer. Um, and that, yeah. that's kind of more the focus I put on. This is a pretty recent change, but like we've been trying to in like when we explain the appetite and, and how we pick that value, we've been trying to actually call out of like, hey, we think this is an effort that might have some like architectural debate. And so like we've actually added a week to the appetite so that there's space for that. Or like we think this is an effort that could really benefit from a design sprint and some like ideation around like what the flow is and like some research. And so we've like, again, we put a week in for that. Um, and so we're trying to just be transparent on that. I think one thing that has helped on that front too, and we're trying to do more, which is I think, again, not exactly how they explain it in the book, is they kind of treat shaping as a closed door process and, and you wait till it's in a good state. Um, we found we get a little bit more buy-in from our team if we give them some sneak peeks into like what's taking shape that might be next for them. Um, and so if they have strong objections that like we can't get something meaningful done in four weeks or whatever, like there is a window for that um, discussion to happen versus like the handoff. And so uh, I don't think we've totally figured out exactly how much transparency or exactly when to pull them into the process, but I think we've seen that trending in that direction uh, benefits us a little bit from when we do get into the cycle, people have a little bit more context and, and are a little bit more bought in on, on the work that's coming. Yeah, I want to uh, throw in a question that's related, uh, which is do engineers push back when they are given the cycle time and they didn't come up with it? Um, yes, but like also I generally tell them, it's a little bit of a power move, but I'm usually like, well, I could do it this way. and. A lot of them have the pride to like um, to, 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 you know, uh, feel like then they can do it. Um, but I think this is something that we've been figuring out and something that um, we're trying to stress more is getting the engineers in there early and making sure that they have that buy in. Um, again, I'm pretty involved in most efforts. So it's like a little it's, it's not like, you know, I'm saying oh, I could do this in this much time and then I walk away. It's usually like I could do this much time. I'm here to help if you need it to get done. Like, here are my ideas on how this could get done. Let me know if you think it's right or wrong. Um, so, and I think that, that it, you know, the structure we have right now in the size we're at is a little bit odd because it's not that you have like the, the engineer who's gonna work on it, who's doing the shaping, um, or even just like an architect, like a tech lead that's like part of their team. It's, you know, you just have the VP of product and the CTO as the two who are like doing the shaping just because of the size we're at. Um, but, so I think, that, I think that there's definitely value in the fact that the person who is, Making the um, making the estimate is is bought in and it is part of that uh, task because I think yeah, I agree that if I just gave them something and then I walked away uh, they would revolt. Um, but I think I'm always very involved in that. I think one thing that's helped on that front is uh, you know earlier days when like the code base was basically all written by Bob as like a one man show um, and there was a lot of tech that in there as a result because he was you know trying to build something from scratch and, and see what worked. Um, I think you know when initially I think when people would hear the estimates that he had or, or timelines, um, there was some skepticism because it's like, yeah, if we cut a ton of corners and like replicate all the crap that's in the code base from, from the early days, like sure. Um, but I think we've gotten to a world now where people have seen it enough times that like, they understand that like Bob is shaping these things at this point, like to do them well, like if like to, to architect as well and to write it correctly in the code base, it needs this much time. And I think like some of the, some of the shadow that maybe was cast over it from like the, you know, old days and, and hacky things we did in the code base when there wasn't people around, um, I think have started to kind of like fade out. So I think it is something where you can build some trust cycle to cycle as well. Cool. Um, should we continue with questions? Do you want to go on? Oh, there's a um, bunch. We don't have a ton more. So let's, let's maybe wrap up and we can just kind of hit questions for a while. Is that, does that sound good? All right. Yeah, sounds good. Um, all right. So next one is, are you doing any meetings gathering during scoping and building are you still using Scrum during the four week cycles? Um, yeah, so our meeting cadence basically like this, is like this these days is uh, Bob and I have a, a block every week allocated to shaping. And so him and I meet where we go through things live and like, kind of hammer it out and, you know, use different like uh, lo-fi web tools to kind of like draw stuff crudely or, or write stuff down. And um, so that's, that's definitely part of it. Just make sure that we're always chipping away at, at one of the upcoming efforts since we are a little bit on a rolling basis with how we do our um, cycle planning. Um, the other thing we do that is maybe taken a bit from Scrum, uh, but is not you know Scrum, is uh, we do weekly check-ins with each squad. It's like 15 minutes. 
and we just ask them to run down like where they're at on the effort, uh, how they're feeling, like what questions they have, stuff like that. We look at their board a little bit um, and, uh, and go from there. But it's mainly just like a pulse check to make sure that if there's like any risk of not being able to get something done by the, by the desired time or anything like that, that we're, we're catching it early. Um, in terms of like what the squads are doing within their allotted, you know, cycle time, uh, we're honestly like pretty removed. Like one squad, for instance, like in GitHub uses GitHub projects and they have like different columns and they're, you know, they're moving all their issues through the columns, kind of like you'd see on a scrum board or, or Kanban. Uh, another team is just using a milestone, which is like lists all the issues and they're either just open or closed. And as they get stuff closed, they just close it. Um, and so we've, we've left like a good amount of like room for interpretation on how they do that. Um, you know, some squads are writing like really proper user stories, others are not, and just like agreeing on like what the task is and just hammering it out, however. Um, but like, they're not pointing, they're not pointing those issues. They're not like working on a commit or anything like that. They're just using them to track like to do's basically that need to get done and in doing it in whatever language or um, kind of organization that works best for that small group of people and how they like to collaborate. So we, we tend to leave um, that pretty open to the people doing the work. Um, well, I think that answers a, a related questions, a question on how are you using hill charts and to-do lists? So basically, uh, yeah, everybody picks their own stack on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all in GitHub. We, we have that limitation. Um, uh, we'd like to use hill charts. We, you know, we don't use Basecamp actually for like our project management. So there's not like, to my knowledge, it's not really built in any other software. I think it's a really interesting concept. And, uh, and one of those things that I think is a cool way to represent work in progress. Um, just you know, hasn't seemed worth switching tools for. So yeah, uh, we, we get a lot of where they're at and kind of like feel where they're on the hill just from those weekly syncs where we're getting just like the verbal updates and, and a sense of how everyone's doing. Yeah, makes sense. Do you use a template for the shaping docs? Yes, uh, so that is something where early days was you know pretty inspired directly from ShapeUp. Uh, we had a period in the middle where we were a little less disciplined about you know the exact template and stuff we were using. Um, and now uh, we've actually recently just recreated a new one that, again, is very similar and inspired by the way uh, Shape, uh, Shape Up outlines it, but um, just as a couple small tweaks and nuance for, for things that are important for our organization or for other stakeholders. Um, but yeah, we are, we are trying to work off of like a standard template for that. Cool. I, I'm just going to like yeah, move through them. <laughs> Do people switch squats between cycles or are you always assigned to the same squat? Um, so it's been pretty consistent. I think, you know, we might have some shuffling here or there going forward, but, um, typically we try to leave it alone. I think, uh, part of that is because each squad is, is allowed to work in unique ways and, and figure out what works for them. Uh, if we were constantly shuffling people across squads, I think you'd lose some of the momentum that's developed cycle over cycle. And so like, we probably would want to specify a more standard way of like doing the implementation work so that it's easier to plug and play people. Um, and uh, I guess just full disclosure, what we found in a remote team is our squads are really small. So the engineers are just paired up. So we have two engineers on a cycle and we've just found that like, it's just less overhead from a planning and meeting perspective, it's easier collaboration. You can still get a lot of stuff done with two engineers uh, instead of four or five, which is maybe a more typical squad size. Um, it lets us have a few more efforts in flight in parallel because we have more squads. Um, so if anyone gets, you know, if anyone were to get delayed or something, it's a little bit less impactful because we have other stuff going on and across other departments. So uh, we, we have so far have kept those pairs pretty intact. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Bob, if you uh, have any thoughts on how that all evolved. Yeah, no, I think, I think the, the, the variety of uh, choices between the P, even between like, um, you know, the PMPD pairs that we have and the two uh, engineering duos that they, uh, that they manage with um, even even like the engineers that they work with PMs will have two different completely different flows that they work with the engineers. So I think shuffling people around would be really really disruptive to the way that we work, um, just because people are relatively um, bought into the way that they work and you know they build their systems around that. Um, so I think yeah, that so that's the, so no, we don't really <laughs> shuffle people. Uh, I, I think we might see some consolidation in how people work, you know, as PMs think through like, Hey, I do it this way. What do you do? And, and Oh, that looks good. I'm going to take that too. But like, I think, I think what we want to leave it as is like, let them come to that realization on their own. Like, I don't like, we just, I just don't care to be in the details of like how they're writing their tickets and stuff. I'd rather let them figure that out. All right. Um, how do you get designers and developers to work well together? As in, how do you get the developers to happily start the development without full designs? Is that something you experience? 
Yeah. Yeah. So good. I was just going to say, I think that one of the things that we definitely, um, I think this is difficult. Um, I, th I know that a lot of our engineers, especially when it's something that is a relatively complex front end, um, are very hesitant to start too, too much before they get into the, um, before they get the high fidelity mocks, because, um, you know, you start building on a component tree and then it all doesn't matter because the designs are completely different. Um, I think what we found a good success for is, and maybe this is just partial to some of the work we do, but it is, you know, just getting the, the, the first piece going and making it so that it can be lo-fi um, and getting that back end um, stuff working um, has been a big success for us. Um, we did just have a squad do all of the front end work first, which I'm still learning about how that went. Um, uh, but they had the mocks up front. Um, I realized I jumped in here thinking I had something really meaningful to say, and maybe Jay has but something better to say. But mostly, just we go back end first is usually the, the, the route there. And yeah. luckily, most of, most of our things are front. Yeah, we have we have all full stack developers. So um, I think it's I think uh, it's hard. I think it's one of the hardest problems, and I think we we flag that in some of the challenges in the in the last slide. Um, I think uh, what I can continue to try to beat the drum on is that I think there's related stuff that developers can start on, even if they can't do like exact feature work. I think that's like, you know, they can just familiarize themselves with that part of the code base. We tend to move the squads around the app to some degree. So it might be part of the code that they don't have a ton of experience in. So getting in there uh, at times they go in there and, and just refactor stuff for a few days, just because they're going to be spending, you know, a couple of weeks in there and they, they already recognize some things that can improve, be improved pattern wise. And I think that's good like upfront work to set the stage. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've had people spend some time doing like, hey, this flow is going to be really hard to test because it's like deep in our process and a lot of conditions need to be correct for, uh, you know, you to go through it as a user. So like maybe we need to build out our seed data so that it's easier when we spin up review apps to, uh, to walk through it without having to waste a bunch of time making fake projects and making fake data. Um, and that's really, that's like really useful groundwork to lay, even without knowing what the exact solution is going to be because you know, you know, you know, the stipulations that are going to need to be required to, to test it. And so um, it's not like really an answer. I think it's a challenge we still struggle with, but I think uh, getting product and design ahead of cycles is something that we'll probably continue to tinker with because um, it does seem to help uh, if, if you can do it. And uh, I don't think we've figured out the exact right way to do it yet. Cool. There's one question that maybe I can answer. It's, uh, it says, who's responsible for shaping? And I'm wondering how the PM fits in this framework. Maybe uh, you joined after we started, but I think, JH, you said that it's you and Bob exclusively doing the shaping right now together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I usually share it with, uh, you know, the people on my team, the designers and, and the PMs, like in our one-on-ones or other things, just to give them previews and get their input on it and stuff. And I think that's usually uh, has been helpful and effective. Um, but yeah, it's, it's predominantly Bob and I, and we're, we're trying to figure out the right way to share it with squads so they get some sneak peeks and, and see it coming. But, uh, you know, we're largely left to, to do it ourselves. And how do you handle knowledge sharing to make sure all knowledge on her, how certain stuff works isn't stuck in one squad? That's a good question. I think we're feeling like as a, just a, as a, just a whole company and team, like we're at this stage of like, you know, when you're really small, everyone has to be a generalist and know everything just out of necessity. Cause if you'll hit two engineers, the two engineers are going to work across the whole app. Um, and I think we're not quite at the uh, scalar size where like everyone being more specialized into domains or, or different areas of ownership would, would be like the obvious or more natural path. We're kind of like in between. And so, I think we're starting to try to do our best, like when we are shaping and, and thinking about upcoming cycles or like what focus a quarter's uh, a squad's gonna have for the quarter. I uh, doing what we can to play to squad's strengths. So like this squad has worked a lot in this part of the code base and we're gonna have a focus that's probably gonna overlap with that. Let's try to earmark that squad for those cycles. And like, let's, so, so we're kind of doing it in this ad hoc way where we're, we're trying to limit how much context switching and how much jumping around we're having squads do, but like it's imperfect because you know, we only have so much capacity and if there's something that's really high priority that we need to get done, we're just going to put a squad on it and they're going to learn it, you know, as part of that work. Um, but, but Bob, I think you probably thought about this more because I know engineering uh, brings it up a lot in terms of, uh, you know, ownership on parts of the code base and, and knowledge and stuff like that. Yeah, I think um, the best thing that we've done so far is um, we have a weekly brunch and learn where we just have all the engineers in a room. Um, and then we have presentations between the engineers. Um, and a lot of that is just, hey, I just did this thing. Here's how I did it. Like, here's some cool stuff I learned. Um, and so um, that's been really, really helpful for us for disseminating knowledge. Um, but yeah, I mean, to Jay's point, like I kind of know how everything works. And then, uh, so that's usually where the knowledge uh, is held. Um, so this is something that I think that I don't know that I have a perfect answer for, but I do find that just getting people talking about the things that they're working on um, and then 
we tried to institute random PR, um, like just ra like uh, having people pick random people to choose P uh, to review PRs. Um, but that's not gone super duper well because everybody just feels over indexed already. And so therefore adding another responsibility has been difficult. Um, but I found the branch elements have been really, really nice because um, it does allow us to just yeah, allow people to kind of talk about what they've been working on. Um, and, they, and I think the patterns are starting to emerge. Like we have one squad that uh, mostly owns and manages like our design system stuff. And so like in their cool down weeks, we have them typically do design system related tasks. Um, obviously in the course of other work, other people are contributing to it or doing it, but like they kind of know that those two people are good people to go to if they have questions on that stuff. And so like, we're kind of getting into some like natural ownership and localization, uh, specialization, whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, I think we're probably like one more like growth cycle on team size away from that being solved in a more thoughtful way. Uh, one question is about, can you restate the size of your engineering organization real quick? Uh, if you pair developers into squads, how many squads do you have? Yeah, so uh, there's 10 engineers, not counting Bob. So, uh, and so there's five pairs, so five squads. Um, and then basically we have, um, we're in a little bit of hiring cost right now, but like two PMs, two product designers, and then um, a person who is in like a hybrid role. So she does product design and product management uh, because she's on our growth team. And so we want there to be one person owning growth initiatives. And so what it basically looks like is that growth hybrid person works with one squad. So she works with two engineers and they all, they do, they're also in cycles, but they're all doing growth stuff. Um, and then we have a PM and product designer who uh, two pairs of them who both oversee two pairs of engineers. So they work with, so they each work with four engineers and basically two kind of work streams. Um, again, this is where the cycles being offset and not on the same cadence is really nice because it allows the PM and designer to kick off an effort uh, where they have a lot of upfront work with one of their squads, get it rolling, let the engineers kind of take over a lot of it, then kick off the next one for the other one into like, that's possible because they're offset time-wise. If they were all hitting on the same day, I don't know how feasible it would be for the PM and the designer to support uh, two squads like that simultaneously. All right, I think we're good on questions. Cool. Um, so our current process is not, uh, you know, super dissimilar to some of the stuff we've shared, uh, but just to kind of summarize it, um, so leadership, uh, so really uh, the other two co-founders, um, Bob, myself, the four of us, will kind of hammer out what the focuses are for the quarter. And we basically try to, you know, there's some nuance here, but try to pick one focus per squad. So this squad is going to focus on, you know, our participant experience in, in this slice of it or whatever it may be. Um, usually there's some sort of outcome or objective or metric that, uh, that ties to that so that we have some way to, to kind of measure what we're doing there. Um, then within the quarter, uh, Bob and I are shaping and selecting what each uh, squad is going to do next. Um, so as I mentioned this before, it's not really a betting table. Uh, it's just the two of us arguing until we <laughs> land on something that we feel like is a good approach. Um, but it's helpful because we have that focus to come back and like weigh our arguments against and make, oh yeah, that does seem more impactful to this outcome. So, let, so let's pick that. Um, we're using a single template uh, per cycle. Um, and one evolution we've made there is um, that template now is intended to span both shaping and implementation. And so there's some stuff around the implementation uh, that the squad is expected to document or update. Um, it's nothing super detailed. Like we're still having them do their work in Figma and GitHub and like that's where all the specs live. The idea is that this is like higher level questions of like, what's the rollout strategy for this cycle? Are, are we gonna ship things to production just iteratively whenever they're done and just like push it right to master? Are we gonna put stuff on an Epic branch and wait until it's all complete and then we'll release it? Is it gonna be an AV test? And so therefore we need to set that up from the start. Um, Similarly, like, is this something we're going to announce with marketing? And if so, to what segment of customers and through what channels? Um, and so there's just a couple of high level questions on the uh, implementation side that we'd like to have in that document as well, so that anyone in the company can open that document, read through it and get a pretty good sense of like what this effort is doing and, and how we're rolling it out. Um, cycles all range from two to six weeks. Uh, Bob and I select that. Uh, as I mentioned, we're trying to bake in um, time for engineering, uh, you know, debate or design sprints or whatever into that time to, to make sure that um, the people have the right amount of time to, to put into uh, answering questions that need to be answered. Um, and then the to be cool down um, kind of at our collective discretion. So as Bob mentioned, sometimes the squads really bring it up and, and they need a breather and that will be the impetus for, for putting them on a cool down period. Um, other times we're behind on shaping or timelines of the different cycles across squads are starting to line up and we want to offset them again. And so we'll put in a cool down period to do that. Um, so there's a handful of factors that go into that, um, but usually it's something that we're able to kind of navigate through pretty cleanly. And then uh, I mentioned this bunch, but within the cycles, the squads have a lot of autonomy to manage as they want. 
Um, and we do a weekly check in with them just to make sure things are on track and there's not like any, you know, glaring issues that have bubbled up. So um, that is basically it. And then the last thing I'll close with, and then we can uh, handle some more questions is, um, the challenge was we're still working on, and we, this, I think most of these have mostly have come up, but um, how do we make sure there's time for design iteration, architecture debate, or user research within cycles? Uh, we're doing our best right now just to like explicitly state that we gave you an extra week <laughs> for this, so like please do it. Um, I don't know that that's the best solution, but it's like a good band-aid for now uh, until we think of something better. Um, we would like, if we could, to get product and, and design a little bit further ahead um, so they can come into it a little bit more opinionated than engineering, but um, you know, there's drawbacks to that too. So like, we're not like, we're not fully committed to, to changing course there. Um, how do we just make sure that we can still be experimental and, and iterative in this framework? So um, I think making sure that, uh, and Bob mentioned this earlier, the kind of the DNA of the company was try things, see if they work, if they do double down on them. Um, we don't want to lose that. And so, you know, making sure we can still do maybe a two week cycle that's really around about setting up an AB test, letting it run for another cycle. And then if it's looking good, you know, we can come back and roll out or iterate on it. And so uh, we haven't totally nailed that, but we're, it's something we think about a lot and we're trying to make sure we don't lose. Um, I think the biggest question that we don't have to tackle at the moment, because uh, we're we're probably at a little bit of a hiring plateau for, for a little stretch here, but um, just as we grow like another round and we get a handful more squads and, and a few more product people, like I think we're kind of at the point where uh, Bob and I can't be shaping everything. And so we might need some like director level folks in between who maybe oversee a couple squads and, and they're taking that on that responsibility or something like that. Uh, I don't know exactly what that evolution will look like, but you know, we can't shape everything for everyone forever. Like that's just not going to work. Um, so I think with that comes the need to like document our way of doing things. Obviously there's this whole shape up book. We don't exactly follow the book. Uh, I'm not saying that we're going to write our own book, but like we need some internal documentation around, you know, making sure we're all on the same page because it's a unique way of working. And, and most people we hire, uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve to, to get used to it and, uh, adopt some of the principles and values of it. Um, and, you know, uh, so those are some of the things that we're thinking about going forward um, and we'll probably continue to tinker with, but um, that's it. So we can just kind of cruise on questions. Uh. Awesome, cool. Uh, I guess uh, now would usually be a round of applause, but I mean, this is uh, it's the digital way of it. Um, cool, yeah, that's a couple of questions that came in since then. So. I think once that relate, one that is related um, directly is, do you think PMs should be able to shape? If not, what should they learn or what are they missing? I think, I think so. I think it's just, a, I think it's just at what seniority. So like right now our, our org is pretty flat, flat. like there's me as, as the head of product and then there's individual PMs. I think in a world where maybe you're a little like hierarchical where you have like a VP director and a couple individual PMs, I could see like the director level probably owning shaping, making a ton of sense. And I think that's probably what we might evolve towards. Um, but I think in general, uh, I think the the skill set the PMs need to just do the day-to-day -day work, I think translates really well to shaping, right? Like they need to make decisions. They need to know how to make trade-offs. They need to know what's impactful to the business. They need to know what's impactful to users. Um, and you're just doing that in shaping at a higher level. Like you're, you know, we're, we're making this decision on this effort because we think it's more impactful or whatever, or it's, it's better, you know, ROI from a scope perspective. Um, and I think PMs also need some, uh, you know, technical fluency, not in the sense that they can write code or, or be this, but like they need to have an intuition around like what's easy or hard and like what's big or small. And so, uh, you know, I think why Bob and I are able to go back and forth really quickly is, um, you know, having been in the weeds together when the team was super small for like a year and a half, I have a really good grasp on like what's easy or hard to do in the app. He has a lot of opinions on the product flows and the user needs. And so like, we're kind of able to speak the same language across those, uh, across those areas. And I think. Um, those are things that I think make an individual PM successful just in day-to-day -day work. And I think they translate to shaping well. So, um, uh, I think it's just a matter of seniority and like what your org needs, but I, I'd expect most PMs to have the right general skill set to be able to pick it up would be my, I guess, high level answer. Yeah, that makes sense. One of the questions is, would you be open to sharing an example of one of your shaping documents? I don't know if that's something you want to do. Um, that's probably something we should check. With somebody else on like what we can or can't make public um i think we'd probably be cool to make like the generic empty template uh available that we've landed on if, if that's cool for for people um you know it's like nothing earth shattering but we think it works for us um i don't i'd have to check with other folks if we're comfortable like you know exposing like proprietary stuff that's it's in those for like real efforts but um yeah sure that makes sense Cool. And then we do have this one open question, but I think Bob, you answered it uh, around how often does a feature take more than four weeks and what happens uh, if it does? 
uh, and you spoke to that, I think. Yeah, it's, it's you know, we try to avoid it, um, but uh, I think one thing that happens in product development, right, and I think you see this in the original, like, agile manifesto, of just, like, responding to change and uh, adapting as needed, and so, like, we've definitely had cases where things ran a little over, and um, I think it's honestly been easier in our current framework to to allow for that because we're not everyone's on the same cadence and it doesn't throw off the whole like betting meeting and everything else. So uh, we certainly try to avoid it at all costs, but it's a little easier for us to like recover from when it when it does happen uh, these days. That makes sense. All right, um, that's kind of the end of the questions. Unless uh, some of you on the call have direct questions, I mean we're a small group here, so. Feel free to open up your mic if you want. Cool. Yeah, I mean, okay. I hope this is helpful. Uh, <laughs> some of those things that we think a lot about, um, but I know everyone has their own way of doing things. Uh, so uh, hopefully there's, there's something here that other people might be able to pick up or, or think about. Definitely. This was super interesting uh, from my point of view as well, because, uh, I mean, I've spoken to a few teams now who are using ShapeUp. Um, and all, all are putting their different like take on it. All have their different take on it. And um, there were a ton of uh, points that resonated with me personally uh, around cycle length as well. I think you made a good point for the four week in the beginning. Um, something I think for our team to reconsider. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm personally taking a lot from this. So thank you both of you for making the time and everybody for showing up. Um, if you want, I'll just hang out in the, in the gather space some more, um, maybe it would be, um, you're free, free to join me. I'll just use the link for completeness. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, thank you, JH, uh, yeah. and Bob. And then, yeah, just let us know, David, if, uh, you know, sharing a template or something would be helpful or whatever, just shoot me an email or people will do can follow up offline too. Thanks for having me. All right. Us. Cool. Thanks guys. Thank you all. Yeah.